So when we come up with titles, we're supposed to find something that's cute but not too cute, clever but not too clever, and descriptive. So this is like a nice, respectable, God-fearing title. But I'm about to change it on you for one that I'm going to plagiarize directly from a 1460s manuscript, which is the first Western treatise on reconstructive surgery. And you'll see why in a minute. So our new title is going to be How to Make a New Nose for Someone, <laughs> which is off entirely and has been eaten by the dog. <laughs> that is verbatim. You can tell it was a German manuscript, very long. Um, so you're probably wondering, how do you make a new nose? Why is it off entirely? What does a dog have to do with it? Well, let's start in the beginning. So put yourselves back in a world where the slightest transgression will cost you your nose. 2,600 years ago, we're starting in India. See, corporal punishment was alive and well. If you stole a mango, off with your nose. If you canoodled with the wrong man or woman, off with your nose. Now, knowing people as we do, it didn't take very long before there were a large number of noseless canoodlers running around. <laughs> And it became a bit of a problem. So they changed it with an edict that said that these people could seek redemption at the hands of a surgeon. Fortunately, such a man was present. His name was Sushruta. You see him here. He's known as the father of modern surgery, and he truly was an incredible surgeon. And because there was such a large patient population that all needed rhinoplasty, this was indeed the most commonly sought surgery in the community at this time he was able to develop an incredibly elegant technique using skin from your face to reconstruct the 3D structure of your nose. So life went on, noses were saved, centuries passed, and eventually the manuscript he wrote was translated into Arabic, and it traveled into the Middle East through the trade routes. And from there, it passed on into that mecca of trade and cultural melting pot of Sicily. Now, this was a fortunate timing because Sushruta's work was encouraged by that huge patient population, Europe had another problem that would also advance surgery. In the 1400s, there were at least 50 independent European wars, many of which were focused around Central Europe and the Italian peninsula. It was bad. There was a lot of facial trauma occurring during this period of time. We learned a lot about medicine during this period of time because surgeons could actually see inside people who were still alive on the battlefield. <laughs> now, yeah, well. Science advanced greatly. Now, the secret of the rhinoplasty, the Indian secret, went to three people. The first of whom we discuss is a member of the Order of the Teutonic Knights. Now, somehow he picked this secret up from an Italian and he brought it back with him to the siege of Marienburg. Now, his name was Heinrich von Faltzpaint. And the Teutonic Knights made a tremendous stand here. It was a three-year siege, and he treated over 4,000 patients for trauma. And apparently, he did rhinoplasty enough times that he decided to write about it. So he wrote a manuscript called How to Make a New Nose for Someone When It Is Off Entirely and the Dog Has Eaten It. <laughs> I'm not going to let you forget that, just in case. It's a cumbersome title, right? And he... Well, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page, okay? So, why would your nose be off? Why would a dog eat? Well, you know, there was a lot of warfare during this period. Words would be exchanged, sidelong glances resulted, insults would fly, and eventually, you're off to the races. And this would inevitably result in that cruel twist of fortune. which resulted in two more people who needed rhinoplasty. <laughs> Trauma was a big incentive to invent new surgical techniques. And of course, let's not forget that after the duel, ooh, uh, this was a problem. Not only does it suggest that if a dog did not eat your nose, you could put it back on your face, which is already an advanced surgical technique, but this spurred innovation. Now, the problem is that Heinrich von Falzpaint never intended to share this technique with anybody. He wrote the first manuscript on it, true, but it was intended for the secret archives of the Order of the Teutonic Knights. And he was so careful about the secrecy that the entire first chapter is about maintaining secrecy, how to swear the patient to secrecy, how to not let them see what you're doing to them so that you can keep this and presumably make money from it. And he was so good at this that he took the secret to his grave for 400 years 
the manuscript was not discovered. However, fortunately, those people who gave the secret to him in the first place were alive and kicking and doing quite well. And these were the two dynasties of rhinoplasty as they formed. House Vianio in Calabria and House Branca in Sicily. Now, they both basically did the same thing as far as we can tell, but we know very little about it because they were quite secret. And their business was definitely booming as we turn into the 1500s. Wars were good for business. Dueling was good for business. But there was another thing that really sparked innovation and was going to set this tide for a sea change here. And that's the fact that in addition to trauma and the increased amount of noses being removed by dueling, this was the time of the Great Pox, which roughly coincides with Columbus, 1494. The Great Pox, or syphilis, or the French disease, <laughs> spread across Europe. And it was ravaging the Italians. Now the problem was that syphilis is a nasty disease. In the tertiary form, it will destroy your nose. In the congenital form, it will destroy your nose. It got to the point where any nasal trauma was associated with venereal disease, which really meant that if you got your nose chopped off in a duel, you wanted it to get taken care of quickly. This created a huge market need. But the problem was the secret was still deadlocked in the hands of the Vianio and the Branca. And it wouldn't be until this guy came along and unveiled it for the world. Now this guy, anybody out there who wants to give a talk, talk about this guy, Leonardo Fioravanti. He was incredible, he deserves at least three independent talks. <laughs> he was a failed doctor turned surgeon, turned folk healer, turned the first mail order medicine seller, turned publisher, turned court alchemist, and the list goes on. And in the course of this illustrious and checkered career, he was wandering the Calabrian Peninsula looking for folk remedies that he could then repackage with fancy Latin names and call cure-alls. And he heard about the Vianio's rhinoplasty technique and he said, I've got to have this. So he goes to the Vianio's and he says, guys, um, I don't want to know your secret, but I have a cousin whose nose was chopped off and he's far away and he wanted me to find out about it for him. But I don't want to know your secret. Um, I'm really squeamish. I don't like blood. I'm going to hide in the corner and I just want to listen to the surgery and talk to you during the procedure, okay? And for whatever reason, they were like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> and what he writes in his own journal after this is that he was pretending to be squeamish and he spent the whole time sort of watching the whole procedure. And in short order, after this, he published a book called The Mirror of Universal Science where he verbally describes the whole technique. He didn't ever actually practice it. No, he was the sort of guy who, when he performed the first, first splenectomy in Europe, he actually hired another surgeon to do it for him and then took the credit. <laughs> but he leveraged the mirror of universal science to get his medical degree. And in the process, passed the secret on to this guy, who was, in fact, a real surgeon. Now, Talia Kotzi was considered one of the best surgeons of the time, and he actually did the work to write a real book that had the full description, 100 pages, lavish illustrations of the technique. And it's for this reason that he's erroneously called the father of plastic surgery and why his face appears on the American Board of Plastic Surgery seal, stolen right off this painting. Now, you guys have waited long enough. So here's his secret, and here's how it worked. Got to get someone without a nose. That's this poor fellow over here. I'm about to show actual patient data on the right, so if you're squeamish, uh, look away from the slide. This is the man who shot his nose off with a shotgun. This is from 1987. Now, the next thing you need to do is the whole secret to this, which is to get a skin graft that you're going to use to reconstruct the nose. This is very similar to the Indian method, but the skin comes from the arm rather than the face. You create two parallel incisions above your bicep, you then pass a piece of leather or cloth underneath the skin and you prevent it from healing. It's called delayed healing for a period of weeks. Now if you do this, the back side of the skin flap granulates and becomes rough. The top side thickens and becomes sort of spongy, kind of like the nose. When it's ripe, as it were, you cut the end of it off here. That creates what's called a pedicle flap. Now this is where the real genius of the technique comes from. The next step is to strap the patient's nose to the patient's face, <laughs> like so, using this arcane sort of straitjacket splint type system. And you re-injure the nose in the process to stimulate healing, suture the flap over. And the whole point of this is that by keeping the flap attached to the blood supply from the arm, it doesn't die until it's integrated with the nose. You then 
get someone like this. This is a real patient receiving this treatment. And you wait for anywhere from weeks to 40 days or longer to get this. But the result is quite incredible even then. That, you can't tell. And this is much what it would have looked like then. We have testimonials from the Vianio that the people who had the most excruciating time getting the procedure, but they were quite pleased because no one knew they had surgery. There was a wait list around the block to get treatment. And so you would think that with the secret out, surgeons around Europe would be flocking to it and there would be an explosion of medical innovation. But the exact opposite happened. By publishing the book, Talia Kotze may have actually delayed innovation in surgery for a while because it was the wrong place at the wrong time. So let's look at why. First, nobody expects the Inquisition. Yeah, so the Inquisition and the church were not real fans of plastic surgery. They didn't like the idea that you were recreating and restructuring God's creation. So there was a lot of unease around this. They didn't go out burning people for it, but they didn't approve of it. People also didn't approve of it because they figured that if you had some sort of venereal disease, everyone should know you had some sort of venereal disease and shouldn't be able to hide it. They wanted the stigma to be visible and that created this sort of social backlash. Additionally, the social backlash led to fake news. People really thought that the procedure, even though it was published, came from someone else's nose. And there was this idea that if you took a nose from someone else, it was both unethical, and if you put it on your own face and that person then died, the nose would also die. This was called the sympathetic principle. And the nose would fall off. Now, this may have been inspired by the fact that if you had the real surgery and you blew your nose too hard, it would in fact fall off. This was also a very difficult surgery. You needed a good surgeon, a good client willing to put up with it, etc. It was very difficult to promote this. And so there was this period of time for about 200 years where not a lot happened. Until suddenly in 1794, published in Gentleman's Magazine, the place where one expects all good medicine to be published, <laughs> the Indian rhinoplasty came back from the dead 2,600 years later. And there it is. A British doctor saw an Indian man restored using a modified version of Shushruta's technique where the skin came from the forehead rather than from the cheek. He published it and this led to what we now know as modern plastic surgery because shortly thereafter, the book Rhinoplastique was published by Carl van Graaff who was considered the best surgeon in Europe at the time. And he developed a German method. In this method, it's faster than the Italian method because you create a nose hanging off of your arm right from the beginning. <laughs> complete with little slits. Now, this works. The Indian method works. The Italian method works. They were used through the 1980s and 90s. And what's incredible about all of this is that we tend to assume that a lot of this reconstruction and organ growth is really a modern phenomenon of biomedicine, but it was actually really elegantly put in Leonardo Fioravanti's book about the agriculture of the body or the farming of man, that creating these things was our attempt to grow our own parts. And that's a 500-year-old concept there from a 2,600-year-old surgical technique. So there's a lot of humility we can get from that and a lot of sense of where we've come from and where we're going to, because we can grow bladders now that actually work. But it's all based on this concept back then, and we still have unease. People are not comfortable with organs being grown in a lab. That hasn't gone away. But at least there's a long history behind it. And all of this stuff is worthy of a toast. But what we're actually going to toast is not this but that one unnamed canine <laughs> back in the day who ate that nose, who forced us to innovate and create our own. <laughs> to the dog, cheers. Thanks.